time to begin, please sit down. I'm going to stay right here. And as we uh, reconvene, let me say I was told that we have, at last count, 144 viewers on our streaming video of this event from as far away as Chile, and they're leaving comments. So, uh, so uh, thanks again to, uh, well, I should mention Jake Stillman, who's been our, he's, he thought he was just taking on a little sound technician job. Ha, huh. it kind of ballooned. But anyway, he's been great, and others have been great too. Um, and the other thing I just want to mention while it's in, in my mind, and while people are still sitting down, is that there will be DVDs available of today's program through the association office. So I know a few of you, you know, maybe missed part of a talk or this or that, um, but you will eventually be able to view the entire thing. It will take a while, obviously, but uh, um, that will be available. And of course, we'll have the audio available through the Sea Ranch Association website. Okay, welcome back. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce Linda Jewell, who was a colleague of mine um, years ago at Cal when I was there. Uh, Linda Jewell is Professor of Landscape Architecture and Urban Design at UC Berkeley. In both her teaching and her practice, Linda focuses on ways in which structural interventions, so, you know, think anything, think buildings, think outdoor theaters, parking lots, whatever, can create vivid landscape experiences. She joined the Berkeley faculty in 1991 after serving as chair of Harvard's Department of Landscape Architecture. So we stole her away, that was good. Her, her, her publications and design work have won numerous awards and she has published widely on landscape, construction and design, as well as producing several exhibitions. Linda Jewell, welcome. Everyone, I have to thank Jackie and Donlin um, for this wonderful event and all of the fantastic people that I have met here. Um, the I'm trying to think. I mark something out here. I um, the embarrassing thing when they asked me and I didn't tell them was I had only been to Sea Ranch twice. Okay. But I really wanted to do this. <laughs> so I decided not to let them know. <laughs> Nevertheless, the Sea Ranch, along with other landscapes and writings by Larry Halperin, have had a profound impact on my career and thinking. And I did know, I did have the privilege of knowing Larry well. The other secret is that I began my I began my academic and professional life as an architect. Okay. And it was, Larry was one of the influences um, from a distance that made me consider that maybe I was better suited to be a landscape architect. <laughs> like whoops. Alright. I was going to start by saying that, uh, unlike others here, I am not an expert on Sea Ranch, so I had to build my talk around Larry. And like many architecture students in the late 1960s and the early 70s, a 1960 article, 66 article in Progressive Architecture, with my apologies <laughs> to Architecture Record, was my first introduction to Sea Ranch. Yes, like my classmates, I was taken with the new look of the slope roofs and the iconic forms of the buildings. And we all unthinkingly repeated them in every community center and library that we did in Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, so, at one um, public meeting in an African-American community, I, with apologies, you. Uh, the young, a young man who managed it says, but does it have to look like a barn? 
Um, but what it said to me more than anything when I saw these images was that the landscape is important. And it was important, became important to me as an architect. The title, Ecological Architects Planning the Organic Environment, presented a new way of thinking. I read the details of how the buildings were located and shaped to address the wind, perused all those colorful maps, but the most important thing was the piece introduced me to a new name, Lawrence Halperin, who I knew nothing about until that point. And I realized that my own interests were as much about the inside-outside relationship of buildings and landscapes as they were about buildings themselves. Fortunately, I found support for my inside-outside interests as I progressed through my architectural training through Harold Hamilton Harris, some of you know of, who became my mentor until he died in 1990. And later, in 1969, those of us that were architecture students in that period, we were hit hard by three books that were published. And it, we all, I'm hearing, I hear this from all. Everything was changing. And uh, although Design with Nature eventually meant a lot to me, uh, and certainly complexity and contradiction were important, but the one that spoke to me was the RSVP cycles. And I struggled to understand, I always said it was like catching fireflies to try to understand what Larry was talking about when he talked about resources, scoring, value action, and performance. But I finally said I got the part that it was about a reiterative process. And it was a process that was based on observing the landscape and understanding the landscape. Whoops, did I go backwards? Oh, and there was that image. This was from RSVP, Cycles. And if nothing else had pulled me in, this image itself got me interested, that was probably what initially interested me in reading the, R, the RSVP cycles in um, more detail. So when I began to think about graduate school, since Larry wasn't teaching anywhere, I began to look around, and I ended up at Penn with the intention of actually studying both landscape architecture and architecture, but I never finished architecture. My first my first contact with Larry, the first time I ever met him, was when I was a student at Penn. And his sort of rousting with Ian McCard was a well-known fact among the students. And he came to be on a review, not in my studio, unfortunately, or maybe fortunately. And we were all gathered around the door, looking in, and Larry laid back, looked at all the regional maps, lined up on the wall and said, Ian, I like your tie-dye maps. <laughs> it was 1974 after all. Uh, the I didn't really get to know Larry beyond that. I took my copy of RSVP Cycles and he signed it. And that was it. And then I first began to know him when I was chair at Harvard. He wrote me a nice note congratulating me. He would always talk to me at various events. And then when I came to Berkeley, I also had the opportunity to spend time with him, one of the most socially and professionally. One of the best evenings was when our my friend um, Rich Haig was in town. That's Rich right there. He once worked for Larry. I went out to dinner with Larry, Gary Ekbo, and Larry Halpern. If that wasn't a great opportunity, you cannot imagine. It was fantastic. And Garrett and talk about rousting, they did their rousting as well. Okay. So I began to, for long, most of my career, I've been interested in what I call on-site insight how landscape architects in particular spend time on the site designing uh, as well, um, on the site as well as in paper. And coming from architecture, I really didn't have that skill. 
And it took me a while to begin to develop it. And I think it's in us all, but you have to develop it. And so I began to write about that, and Larry was one of a number of people that I began to interview because I realized that most of the landmark projects that I admired, whether they were by Halperin, Hay, Tommy Church, um, projects built by the CCC, making decisions on the site had been an important part of the design. They were not done in isolation in the, in the studio. Um, so uh, I interviewed him for some academic articles, and then later he contacted me because he knew I had done an exhibition on outdoor theaters, which actually was with Jackie at the museum. And uh, he wrote me and asked me, or he called me with Dee's help, uh, could he borrow anything I had on the exhibitions that he was redesigning Stern Grove. And I spent a wonderful day in his office, and he managed to keep my 12-year-old daughter engaged through the entire day. And I interviewed him um, about his process once again uh, on Stern Grove. And I wrote an article, I proposed an article for Landscape Architecture Magazine. At Stern Grove, it was very obvious from conception to the last stone being put in place that he was making decisions on the site as much as he was making them on paper. And that that is part of the reason it's such a very, very special place. So there, that's the piece. Ah, but back to Sea Ranch. I had to talk about Sea Ranch, okay? So I knew that the Penn Archives held, held all of Larry's papers. So I made a trip this summer and spent three and a half days in the archives. What a fantastic experience. I saw many things, we've seen this many times now. Uh, what I didn't know is that it's a drawing about six feet long with some color on it. This is, I couldn't photograph the six feet. Uh, everything was bigger, more colorful than I ever imagined. I see Donlin nodding his head. He saw them originally, I guess. I did put together a brief chronology of Larry <laughs> to keep me uh, informed. He started coming to the area in the 1950s. He camped here, he said, in 61 and 62. He was actually retained Formal, he did some schemes in the early 1963, I'll show you one, before any of the inventory. Formally was retained in the summer of 1963. Did the environmental studies with Dick Reynolds in three months, July through September. And by December 63, Oceanic made the final decision to purchase the site. After that, there been, he's written about it a lot, but he actually, his formal engagement as a consultant stopped in 66, although he continued to live here, obviously, and have contacts with certain projects. Oops. One of the first drawings, this was actually in January of 1963. So this was before there were any environmental studies. Oceanic was just considering the project. And you'll see that it's, although there's some indication of the importance of the coastline, it, does not, it is not nearly as radical approach as he eventually went with. Uh, this was an, an initially, at that point it was called, he referred to it as the Del Mar Ranch, which is what it was. It then became, oops, didn't want to go. Then became a North Coast Ranch, uh, Coast Ranch for about six months. And this is where they were identifying where they were going to do all the wind monitoring and take soil borings. And then there were, of course, all the wind studies. When you go to the archives, they are endless. I had no idea they would put Ian McCard to shame in terms of the rigor of the environmental information on this site. He did maps, he did soil maps, slope maps, everything imaginable. He had his own version of tie-dyed maps. He also very initially, you know, he started some initial ideas and sketches, 
or the office did. Some of these drawings are by people in his office, clearly. Still North Coast Ranch. It doesn't want to move. And of course, everyone has seen this drawing many times, replicated many times. What part of my favorite is in here, he includes, and we were all, I guess he was so naive at that point about ice plant. Ice plant was seen as a good thing. We don't think that anymore. And over here, under the need to establish standards and architects and find good architects, there was a note, this will be much harder. <laughs> And he continued, this drawing would reappear and reappear, and his process was actually often to add notes on it. And he would gradually add notes about what was important. One of my favorite was the Italian hill town scheme, because when he was trying to think about what this place would be, he thought about the places where he thought architecture and the landscape were what he was after. And I don't know with what rigor he was interested in this, but he drew it, and I think it's a fascinating drawing. And of course, many of you have seen these. We've moved into 1964 in the, in the spring, where he was, his notebook showed many of his studies for how to reorganize the landscape. And then, just a comment on how he often worked. These were drawings, these were post most of the work but they were drawings to explain what he had done. And he would work them out in the sketchbooks, um, then blow them up, watercolor them, and then blow them up much larger for presentations. And one of my favorite is, and throughout the notebooks, he goes on and on about the awfulness of, of suburbia. And I love this little drawing right here. It's about, he didn't want a cutesy pie subdivision and that there he wrote UGG, U-G-H. <laughs> We've seen some of this before. The level of study was incredible. I'm only showing you a few of those, these things. I had to take them with my camera, with my iPhone. Thank goodness, bless the iPhone. And here was, you can see things have begun to take shape here. You note here the brown are areas that did not perk well, had standing water. He was trying to work schemes around. Um, this was um, the second part of phase one, I guess. They, and he went through multiple road alignments on those. You see here. And finally, this was the one I found that was the closest, but um, anyway. His studies of the roads were incredible. He did drawings, endless drawings, of exactly how this road, he would always do, this is the bad way to do it, this is the way I want you to do it, kind of thing here. And I'm sorry they're not clear. Some were abandoned, obviously. I don't know where he was proposing that, but there was a little structure <laughs> to hang over the landscape. These are two of my favorite. I don't. I, I suspect they were done by people in his office. I don't know, but the the issue is the care with which every little piece of infrastructure was planned, even right down to the drainage structures that we think of as being innovative today. He was doing them then, and then there was the the uh, model homes. <laughs> Uh, when uh, he began to work uh, with both Esh Eshrig and um, Donlan et al., um, he also would generate schemes. This is one that I was mentioning to the Eshrig crowd that I suspect came from their office rather than not from them his, but I don't know. And in 1965, a lot of the work was focused on his own house. And these are some sketches from his site. These are those of you that were there last night. You may relate some of the movements that he was experimenting with here. And then, of course, there were the workshops. Um, 
right here in his notebooks in July of 1966, he most definitely planned the workshops at that point. It's unclear to me at several points he mentioned that the first one happened in 68. I don't know if that's a failure in memory or in fact it did stop in 68. Maybe there's somehow someone here who knows whether they started in 66 or 68, the first one here at Penn Sea Ranch. Nevertheless, they happened, and we had all of the cavorting, semi-cladded people that we saw earlier. This was part of the draw for me, I have to say, being you know from a small southern town, and I saw you know mystical California out there, and everyone cavorting on the beach. That was part of the appeal of uh, of the whole RSVP cycles in Sea Ranch. This is one of my very favorite drawings in his entire book. In, you know, like 30 years of books right here. Sea Ranch was done in 1965. And now I'm just going to take you through a collection of these. What surprised me was the frequency with which he drew individual plants. His horticultural background really came through. And I think it gave him insight for what a single entity, you know, means in a broader landscape, how it can change. Many of them became more abstracted over the years uh, as he was doing work all over the world. Uh, images of the cove and sea ranch would reappear, and it was very clear he was doing uh, as Mitchell uh, talked about this morning, he was using this to refresh himself, using this place, and to make abstract uh, diagrams that eventually showed up in his projects in urban areas. This is about water movement over there. Are those exquisite? Okay, it was my privilege to know Larry, to have him as a part of my education. I thought um, maybe before I read something, uh, some of his quotes, I wasn't going to address sort of uh, my vision for the future, but at lunch I decided I needed to, and that is to remind everyone here that the landscape, when you're occupying it, particularly at even the density of Sea Ranch, it needs to be designed, it needs to be managed, and it needs to be redesigned. And that includes introducing landscape artifacts. There are very few landscape artifacts in this place. A group of us sat on the edge of the asphalt out here because there is no bench. As I, the few times I have been here and I've walked around, very few places to stop, to gather. I realize the environment is harsh, but it's, there are days like this, and there's really no place. This is a chance for experimentation as well, because landscape improvements are relatively inexpensive. They can be changed, they can be modified, so if you want to get flamboyant here and there, do it with a bench before you start with a building. All right, I have one final, can I do, read one final thing from Larry? Okay. He goes on and on about the importance of Sea Ranch, but he says, Perhaps the most memorable feature of all these hauntingly beautiful places that he um, visited were that the whole place, rather than anyone, was about the whole place rather than anyone building, and had a, and that the entire place had a memorable and uh, coherent place. Um, for him. I think I've lost it now. I, here at Sea Ranch, I tested many of my basic ideas on the importance 
of place as a generation of community design. It was there that I attempted to link the character of natural form to the character of built form and to show how one can derive in it in pragmatic ways from the other, one from the other. It was there that I evolved an integration of the two aspects of design, nature and the man-made, into a synthesized holistic combination where you experience both. Thank you. Okay, our last speaker before we engage in group talk is Will Bruder, lead design architect for Will Bruder Architects, a studio of architects and design professionals in downtown Phoenix working to create architectural and urban planning solutions that meet the needs of clients and are appropriate to their contexts. Will is engaged in, in exploring with his Phoenix community the role of design in placemaking within a fragile urban desert environment. But Will is also familiar with our Northern California in, 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 in environment. And I'm very happy to welcome Will Bruder. It's a privilege to be here. This is my second trip, so you don't have to feel sorry. But when I entered architecture in 1965, this was the point of discussion of all of us. It was prescient, it was relevant, it was challenging, it was right. It took me a long time to get here. I had the good fortune, and the title is Looking Back Briefly, because we've had a long look back this morning and this afternoon. I want to look forward. But this is the place, and it can't be denied. I had the privilege of knowing Larry, working with Larry, calling Larry a friend. It was a very special decade or more that I had. On my first trip here, about five years ago, we stayed in Unit 9, remarkable. We spent an afternoon with Larry below his house, totally remarkable. I was totally bitten with the idea. I had the privilege of the intent invitation from Donlin, and then I started to worry, because what was I going to talk about? After all, a sea ranch at the base was just a developer, a development, a land deal. What was it really beyond that? The map that's been used for almost 40 years is a real estate map to show people around. The 50th anniversary is remarkable, and you finally got it. 60 miles of trail, the guide to this place as a landscape, as a place to live, and not just a land deal. But as we look at it, we know that it's much, much more than that and circumstances came to pass. It was the right developer, it was the right representative, the right vision in the Alboki. Project always starts with a great client. You can't do architecture, you can't make a community without a great client in these sort of non-ad hoc but real focused endeavors. After that, take some architects. And what an amazing coincidence, not just architects of the land in Larry Halperin at the right moment at the right time, but more. Turnbull, Whitaker, Lindland, and of course, our friend over there, Eshrick. They came together, young minds, mature minds, experienced minds, ready to take on the world, because this was the early 60s and they were the top of their game. They were dreamers, they were visionaries, and they came to this place and they analyzed the land. And again, Larry's vision was beyond the landscape and the sketches and the mapping and the thoughts, because he knew the land was preeminent and that the whole team would have to be sympathetic. He knew both the experienced Joe Eshrick, and he knew the young folks across the bay that were really thinking properly about the subjects. They were doing delightful small things, and Joe Eshrick had a fine hand for fine-grained work and was a leader of the academy, was a leader of everybody following in William Wilster's footsteps. It was all very special. And this was the barren site they first built on, with all the planning and all the efforts and together. And this, in essence, is one of the most important moments of Sea Ranch, was Condominium One. 
It was like something nobody had ever seen. I would not fully appreciated it until Thursday night when Donlin shared the fact that this was one of the first condominiums ever built in the world. That was vision. That was very special in planning and in individuality, but it was built around modest occupation. It was a second home development. It was this idea, though, of the memories of the great towns of the world, the great communities that grew organically. You come to it, it's like nothing you've ever quite seen. It's so familiar and it's such, yet so original. They connect, they intersperse, going through the indoors, outdoors, because architecture happens from the outside in and the inside out. And this was a perfect harmony of professionals striving for that evolution. So here we are, looking back. The hedgerow houses is seminal and important to this whole idea of a place, as was Condominium One. The first strokes are laid down, and they are at the heart of Sea Ranch to this day. And again, with the privilege of the tour that Donlin gave us yesterday, into the back corners and the energy of this place, from his living room and home himself over off one of the meadows, we began. So here we go. The future begins with the past. We cannot build solidly without the foundations of what we've learned. We have much more than 50 years on this coast to have learned from. But on the left is the fence line of the wonderful sketch, the barn. And here we are standing at a portal where man-made embraces nature and frames the whole proposition so elegantly. And there in his hand is the Sea Ranch map. And we're looking about the spaces in between, and we're looking at this edge condition. And by and large, for the first, first third of the development, both in the meadows and in the forests, all of those beautifully poetic choreographed moves was not just about people. It was about cars. It was about hiking. It was about finding these little nooks. It was understanding the logging that happened before and finding the opportunities to place a residence. It was about just nestling and cuddling and gathering and separating, but in a very wonderful scale. So as we think about the future of Sea Ranch, remember scale and proportion because that is from which it is all magical. Look at these small, wonderful structures. A recent past and from the beginning, there was something intuitively comfortable. In this day of digital renderings and all kinds of visualizations, it still comes down to plan and section. And what makes all these houses, these wonderful inventions of Sea Ranch so special is their mastery of the finest, I mean, we're talking spaces that you guys are occupying there, 900, 1100, 1200, it seldom gets larger. And the maze and the volume, and you walk in and you think you're in 3000 feet or 4000, and you ask for the, the fact, and oh my gosh, I never believed. Because they truly are little, little sculptural, fantasies beyond any comprehension. But again, that comes back to the small ones, the hedgerow houses, and so many of the developments where these close lots knit together. I don't know if some of you realize, but when Eshrick did the first hedgerow houses, he and his colleagues went out there with some stakes, and they found the places to put the houses best around that hedgerow. They staked it. Then they went back, they measured where their stakes were, and then they made the property lines. Now that's the way you design the landscape. Houses, he and his colleagues went out there with some stakes and they found the places to put the houses best around that hedgerow. They staked it. Then they went back, they measured where their stakes were, and then they made the property lines. Now that's the way you design the landscape. You don't have you know, a surveyor lay out a plot and then figure out what consequences there are, what trees have to go away, what trees have to stay, which way the wind's pitching, whatever. It was fantastic. And then this idea of condominium one, and again, up on the edge of the woods, these wonderful clusterings. As you look down from the high points in these sectional houses, you see the connection where you can't read a property line, but you can understand your neighbor's garden and your little protected apple grove. All these things are happening for you. Again, the past, so elegant, weathering so beautifully, so wonderfully. There are so many things to learn as we think about the future of Sea Ranch. The graphic identity, not to be forgotten, with Barbara Sefter from the logo to a mark crossing from the water to the land, from the fancy and folly of the bathhouse. 
And this is new. And this is part of the discovery here. It's a playful place. It's a place of fantasy. This is a very recent house by Dolan for Gray. All the old tricks are there. They still hold water. They're still wonderful. The magic of the super graphic S room. There you're looking into it there for the granddaughter. There you're looking at spaces familiar. And you are looking at the future right now. I woke up at 4 o'clock Friday morning. I'm of that age when you wake up at odd hours. OK, got it? <laughs> and what did I do? I went to your website, being a modern man. I read all 55 pages of the CCNRs of Sea Ranch. Front to back, an hour and 45 minutes before my wife woke up next to me. And that was the best thing I could have done for myself because I read those and I'm laying in the bedroom of the Ramirez residence with our wonderful hosts, Gabrielle and Sarah. This wonderful collaboration between their architects, Norman Mahler and Judith Schein. It's a magical little house. And I was sitting after I finished reading the, the CCNRs and went back and forth because what did I miss? I didn't miss a lot. They're wonderful, wonderful documents and they served you very well. And this beautiful invention of the future and the past that I'm sleeping in, that I'm waking up in, that I'm enjoying was allowed by those CCNRs. So something is very right, ladies and gentlemen. What we have here is the guiding principles of your community. Very, very right. So you got all the things that you can't deny you can do something different because the rules say you can. You've got a sensitive situation of design review. But one thing that is wrong in the CCNRs is we should not allow stain in this environment on any wood or any structure. It is the natural patina of this place that has brought the energy and the memory of it. It is not the emasculated stained wood things that we see below this barn that has anything to do with what is really great about this community. The weathered dark wood, and that's the dark side that Donlin refers to. The shingles, the shingle scaling. We are at a house up on the north end by Eshrick, one of his last houses here. And suddenly I'm sitting there, I'm wondering why are all these things? Why something different and better than the others? He's got a three-inch exposure on the shingles. That's that much, ladies and gentlemen. There's all these different scales. They all look like it could be big stone or small stone. There's big shingle roofs and small ones. There's metal roofs happening now, which is a good thing with the fire and the concerns that way. But look at that wonderful dark patina. And the lodge has all the drapes out. One of the saddest things about Sea Ranch right now is you should all have black shades, please. <laughs> Get rid of the white ones because because as you walk around, it looks like a second home abandoned community with broken shades and blinds, and they know nothing about the magic of this place. I'd much rather have reflective glass seeing the magic of the landscape than all those drawn shades. I'm not modest in my comment. I don't want to be critical, but I want to be sincere in what I've seen and what I feel. What I feel is walking on that little Upon that little siding up there in the forest with the lichen stripes, that was not paint, that was not stain, that was nature's patina. Mark Rothwell would never painted a more beautiful painting. Look at that. And you have it every day if you let it happen. And yet it's not happening when we get worried about the wood, but you do really great maintenance, and I know it costs something. It's about detail at the finest grain. This little walkway up to one of the Binker barns up in the woods. And seeing how that common space, when cared for, when nurtured, can become this amazing landscape. The one thing I miss here right now, where are all your grandchildren? Where are you, your children? Where are all the students from UC Berkeley? They should be here right now, not listening to some webcast somewhere, I hope. <laughs> the windbreaks, they're very, very, very important. And again, Donlin, in the last 24 meetings of this group studying all the issues of this environment, what a better caretaker could, could Larry have than Donna and all of you that worked so hard the last three years on this. It's time when those wind breaks, some of you might be aware, those trees have grown in different sequences. Larry had even thinking, was I right or wrong in his late years of thinking about it? But we're at a point right now where you are planning new wind breaks, good news. But now you have the hard, tough decision of saying, do we cut down the mature trees that are at their life cycle 
so that those new trees we're planting will be strong enough because they have to stand in the wind what, once they're higher than 15, 20 feet and learn to stand proud when they don't have the windbreak because they will blow over before you know it. I think you've reached a point, ladies and gentlemen, that you have to find the Larry Halpern of the future. It might be Loretta, it might not be Larry anymore because the world has changed in every way for the better, but it's time to say all the base work has been done and talk about and put out of RFQ and really reach out much as Oceanic did with great vision and hope you're as lucky as they were when it all began. But phenomenal challenges happening. Now on the left you see hedge houses, hedgerow houses. On the right you see a hedgerow house and you see something else. <laughs> okay? It's not just because it's staying gray that I'm commenting. Part of the romance of this place is the scale of your modesty. Okay, and don't let your foolish wealth of the dot-com period or the next boom or the whatever change what Sea Ranch is. You've built so large in such modest, small ways, and that is your lesson to the world. It's really special. And again, think about those things on the edge and how they respect and how they work back and forth. This is the affordable housing component. And Larry, the architects were very, very interested in diversity in your community. There is a rumor right now that Burbank is going to 86 these houses. 86, you know, gone. These are treasures as much as condominium one. They are an important part of your diversity, your accessibility. They provide a possibility for families, and I see them in the windows. Besides that, they are signature pieces of architecture by William Turnbull. These could be some of the most important buildings on your community. And sure, they're a little bit shabby right now, and sure, they might be a little bit hard to take care of. But when you look deeper into what you have here, to lose these would be tragic, totally tragic. We have such great opportunities right now. There's an area to the north that's some transfer land. It's land that has some other opportunities. So thinking about transfer land, thinking about other availabilities, there is a way to give a balance and a new vitality of new ideas to this community, which is what we'll need for the next 50 years. It can't just be cast in amber. Nature is not, neither should its architecture and its ideas and planning. Now up near the airport, there's an interesting opportunity that I'd like to put forward. I do see some educators in the audience and I'm very happy for that. What about an idea that we have a design laboratory, much as it was when Larry and the guys got here to begin with. What if we take on the challenge? We have a wonderful building here, again, by William Turnbull and the group. What if that be building becomes a, maybe at the beginning, a summer design camp? You saw some images of Haystack School earlier on in this day's presentations. That's a summer camp, basically. And artists and designers from around the world come to work at that place. What if we set up a relationship, not, with, not just with UC Berkeley, but maybe with Woodbury, maybe with Taliesin, maybe with Arizona, maybe with Penn, Yale, whatever? And what if we create a sort of destination where we can both analyze the past and be an amazing resource for this community because it needs to be surveyed, and what better than a bunch of young students? So to get into the game for this program, you spend a month, two months, looking at groups of lots, mapping them, talking about what was good, what was right, how the trees were there, what's all there. We follow that up with the young thinking that Chris mentioned before with some of these young architects of the case study idea, but to bring in looking at these lots that are still available, looking at the opportunities that are still there. Wouldn't that be magical? And what about the dance component that was mentioned? I mean, we look at places like Aspen, we look at places Santa Fe, there are a lot of other cultural events that complement every year. What about summer camps for your grandkids and your kids? What about that whole mix of happening here? Because it's a little bit right now too much like, you know, a place for all of us, okay, to just find comfort and happiness. Commercial right now, there's some amazing opportunities. There was a site for a church and for a school down near Annapolis, right on US-1. That was never to happen. Wouldn't it be wonderful, and there's also a series of six or eight plans done by various architects, including 
or friends that weren't turned on, and well, acronyms I'm terrible with. But again, for a real sense of a town square, a community, a place to you know pick up you know things and meet things and, and a little retail. Why do we have to go out of the community? It would really add, it wouldn't scare things away, it would be a, a real bad vitality. What if down by Annapolis we, we do some little thing where it's nice and central and you can walk or you can maybe ride a bike? We'll talk about bikes in a second. This is the missing drawing. I had it. I stole it. I apologize on him. <laughs> this was the mystery drawing of earlier in the day. I did not really take it, but it was maybe just meant to be. Because as we look at what was diagrammed, wow. What happens if, as we build this community out, we can resourcefully look at the count of Coastal Commission and where the density is, we now have a generation that is the Millennials. I'm a boomer, good, bad, or otherwise. But somehow, on the opposite ends of the bookshelf, my end and their end, we found a search for authenticity, for community, for city, for third places where we sit around, we all were thinking we're going to be in our bedrooms or our computers, we're wrong. We're going to be with people. We're going to have the best coffee. We're going to have these wonderful celebrations of food. We're going to go to public markets. Where's the farmer's market in the middle of Sea Ranch? Wouldn't it be great if they came here and we had a, a Saturday market here? Maybe a Wednesday one too. These sort of opportunities are what make cities. And so we're on a great thing because those millennials are really Sea Ranch, Ranch's future and we're only the caretakers of a few, few more moments. We need to make this prescient and not lonely and abandoned as I've heard north of Fort Bragg it is. You know, this coast is fragile. This coast is special. Let's make 50 years that's a legacy about these people investing and coming here. But look at the sprawl of those wonderful courtyards, those wonderful places. And all this with a careful look of some professionals from your own democratic counseling of the process here, which I understand is unique and it is wonderful. But again, in this democracy that you've created, I don't see anybody that doesn't look like me in this audience. I think you all know what I mean. You know, that's not healthy for all of us because we have an amazing world. And it's getting better because of that diversity. The bicycle. We have six, 60 miles of walking trails. It's remarkable, and now we know how to find them. It's really wonderful, we share some of them, that's good. It's really, really good. Why can we not get 10 miles of bike paths that complement your own safety, your grandkids' safety, your children's safety? There is a plan of foot or discussions. I know I'm walking on things that are sacred and I'm going to have the left side and let's see, I show hands. I never would ask for that. But what about bike paths? They're healthy. They're the future of our cities. Look at our cities. They've totally been transformed as walkable, livable, bikeable. And we're loving it. We're moving in so we can come out here on the weekends or when we get some free time. Or we get this whole energy going for us. You know, what a great opportunity because that is a dangerous road. And you've eliminated the whole western coast of America and their journeys up and down. You've disenfranchised them and created a dangerous world let alone what it could mean for you. You could ride right up and, and go next town up, you could go down tonight for dinner off, off campus. It'd be a wonderful thing. Think about bike, bike paths. I really, really am serious about that. So we've talked about a lot of things, haven't we? Haven't talked about health and aging. That's one of the considerations that we have right now because a lot of us want to know that we've got instant medical care close at hand. What if there was a little place that was a clinic, was some sort of support. What about there's some place for aging in place out here? Some of you might like to stay here. Might be really good. Might be a way you can still hang out with the friends and be here and walk the trails when you're feeling good and sit out in the sun on a nice fall afternoon like today. So aging's there. How about a radical idea? Much more than just the developer's dream, this is a remarkable world treasure. What about that? I think I see a lot of hands up for that right now. This is a totally special place. Special places are very, very endangered in the world we occupy. I would challenge all of you to start a process and start a new committee. 
That new committee is called the NEXT Committee. N-E-X-T, no acronym, just the NEXT, tomorrow. It's not scary. And the first project of the NEXT Committee should be to do all the research and put all your energy and to find out what it would take to make Sea Ranch, the Sea Ranch of California, a UNESCO World Heritage Site that would enjoy the protection beyond the protection you've given it in your wonderful stewardship of this place and hold it not just for your children and their children, but really let the story of what happened here be legion to the world and not just a hearsay conference on a 50th birthday. Thank you very much.